This happened about an hour ago. It was 7.20am central time, and I was in my garage running on my treadmill. I was two and a half miles into my run at six and a half miles an hour, according to the treadmill. You know, average Joe stuff. Whenever I run, especially if I decide to run on a treadmill, I use YouTube for music. I have a playlist with a wide variety of music, ranging from Slipknot to Gorillaz, Elton John to Adele, Katy Perry, Led Zeppelin, Ghost, Lamb of God, yada yada yada. And I like using YouTube because I get the urge to listen to anything else. I just say, hey Google, blah blah blah. I'm listening to my playlist and Pro Memoria by Ghost was about to play, but I got an ad. So I looked down to my phone so I could press the skip ad button. After I do, I look forward to returning. For a brief instant directly ahead of the treadmill, there's this shelf. But just to the right of it, there was this white figure. I didn't see any facial features, but I know we locked eyes in that brief moment. And just like that, it instantly disappeared. Keep in mind, I'm running from the top of my head all the way down to my toes. I got chills and goosebumps lingered for a while. I finished running, I ran four miles and walked one mile. I grabbed a tape measure and measured the shelf. That thing was 52 inches tall. I took a shower and started writing this. I don't know what it was. The other night, on the 19th of July, 2020, my parents were still up at around 11.30, and well, they heard La Llorona crying. My parents and my grandma go outside to check. I'm sound asleep. They told me everything the following day. They said it sounded far away and somewhat loud. And then all of a sudden, it sounded like it was hiding behind our tomato plants and it was deafening. My grandmother starts freaking out, telling my parents to get inside before a La Llorona attacks them. Once inside, my dad grabbed a flashlight and headed back out. He didn't see anything, and it stopped wailing when my dad walked out with the flashlight. There's a small creek that runs behind our house, so it's possible. It's not the first time my parents have heard her, and they claim to have seen her once. So maybe she stuck around and stuck into our garage, just to see me all sweaty. So a little background info. I, my husband and our two daughters, moved into a house built in 1900, back in October of 2014. The following year, in 2015, I had quit my job to stay at home with my youngest, then four, and to be available for school once for my then five-year-old, who just started kindergarten. So fast forward about a month into the school year, October 2015. One day, after I dropped off my kindergartner off at school, I took my youngest for a walk through a very old cemetery around the corner from our house. The cemetery is closed to new graves. Many of the tombstones date back to the late 1700s into the 1800s. The autumn foliage was beautiful. I even took a few pictures. My daughter had never been in a cemetery before and was on cloud nine. She's weird and morbid like me. She was running around inspecting the graves, asking a million questions. And as she sometimes does, she informed me about some of the history about specific graves and the people who were buried. She has a tendency to make up stories about the things she sees that have happened to turn out to be fact later on. I'm not claiming she's psychic, but she definitely has my bloodline in her. We went home within a couple days, and weird things started happening. It started with small things, like... I would feel as if someone had brushed by me walking or something like that. But no one was there. Whenever I was in the basement doing laundry, I started feeling like something was watching me. Then I started thinking I heard whispers or commotion coming from areas of the house no one was in. I was also going through a bit of severe depression at the time, so at first I thought I was just going crazy. Then one evening, I was sitting on the couch with my husband watching TV, and in the corner of the room, we both saw and heard something dark, shadowy, fall from the ceiling and slam on the floor. I jumped, he jumped, we both looked at each other, and he got up to check to see what it was, and nothing was there. It was at that time that I confided in him about the brushes, whispers, and commotion. 
He then informs me that he's heard things too. Like he'd be upstairs in the shower and thought he heard me come home with the kids. Front door open and talking, only to find no one was home when he came downstairs. He just didn't think anything of it, so never said anything. At this point, I realised it wasn't in my head and that our house was likely haunted. It is what it is. Then a few nights later, I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night, maybe around 3am. I got up because I felt wide awake. So I left my room and went up the hallway when I suddenly noticed my youngest daughter on the first landing going down the stairs. I called out to her, what are you doing baby? She looked up at me with the most frightened look I had ever seen on her face and she said, I heard you calling me downstairs. Chills ran through my entire body and I told her, okay, well I'm right here. Why don't you come sleep in bed with me? She ran back up the stairs and went to bed. The next morning after I dropped my oldest off at school, I called my mom. She's, well, I don't know how to put it exactly, but basically a modern day witch and also familiar with hauntings and such. So she tell me see me what I need to do and come over and get supplies. The whole thing basically consisted of putting crystals behind all the doors in the house, spreading Himalayan salt across doorways, going outside and also spreading the salt around each corner of the house and blessing it, and then finally saging the entire house. I'm very familiar with saging as I've done it before. Everything is going fine until the saging comes. I get a fire safe ashtray, fill it up with dried sage, light it and begin the process starting from the upstairs working my way down to the basement. My youngest is with me during this process. I get through the entire house and down to the basement when suddenly the ashtray explodes in my hand. It literally exploded, freaked me out and my daughter. I send her upstairs and I clean up the mess. Meanwhile the entire time I feel like someone's watching me. At that point I immediately called my mom and told her what happened. She then decided she would come over and resage the house. We got to talking and trying to figure out what was going on. What caused this sudden haunting after a year of living there? We came to the conclusion that it was likely many factors. The veil is at its thinnest during the month of October, which basically means the connection to our world and the supernatural grows stronger during this time. I've always been susceptible to the supernatural since childhood, and my depression likely brought out anything that was laying dormant. And that my youngest daughter possibly brought something back with her from our cemetery trip just before all this started happening or awakened something when she was there. After that, everything calmed down and basically went back to normal. On Halloween that year, just a few days after the saging and whatnot, we were with a group trick-or-treating and my friend told me to tell everyone about what was going on. The mass consensus was that we should burn the house to the ground. We didn't, and virtually nothing has happened since. I had an experience with the infamous Franklin Castle in Cleveland, Ohio, US, back in July of 2009. For those not already familiar with the castle, I strongly recommend looking it up. There are a ton of websites that have articles on the history of it, including the known facts, legends, and personal encounters. In July of 2009, my then boyfriend's brother got a free reservation for a guided group tour of Franklin Castle and invited my then boyfriend and myself to tag along with him and his then girlfriend. I've always been fascinated with the castle, so I was pretty excited. I'm not 100% sure that the tour was legal or that the guide even had permission to enter the castle, but regardless, we went. All of the info the guide gave matched up with everything I read about, so at least he was well informed. The guide started outside at 11pm. We were in the yard of Franklin Castle, just staring up at it, and all I could keep thinking about was how long I'd wanted to go in there, and I was finally about to. Once everyone arrived and that reserved a spot for the tour, we started. There were about 20 or 25 of us. The guide took us around the outside of the castle, telling us about it, and then we headed in and went to the first floor, where the servants area initially was. Within about 15 minutes of being there, I started to feel kind of funny like overloaded. I knew what was coming and tried fighting it off but couldn't. 
I started to get dizzy and things started to get dark. I went and sat on the steps, freezing, pale and sweating it out. After about five minutes, I was okay to go on. It was just so intense. Things like this have happened to me before when I'm around immense amounts of energy like that. I think the energy of the house was just too much for my sensitivity. We carried on to the second floor, then the third floor. At this point, I was standing around with a couple other people listening to the guide tell us about the floor and any stories surrounding it. All of a sudden, I hear these light footsteps coming from above. I thought it was just my imagination or maybe someone went up there ahead of the guide. Then the girl next to me asked the guy next to her, did you hear that? One of them asked the guide if anyone had gone upstairs yet and the guide confirmed that no one had ventured to the fourth floor yet. Then we went to the fourth floor and wrapped up the tour. Part of me couldn't wait to get out there, but another part of me wanted to look around some more. So I followed my boyfriend's brother and his girlfriend down to the third floor, then the second floor, and finally the first floor. I was walking behind my boyfriend's brother's girlfriend through the kitchen area, and she stopped in the doorway into the living room area. I was standing behind her, and I suddenly got this overwhelming feeling of uneasiness. To say the least, I got out of there right away. I made my way outside and waited for the others. The tour was nice and the castle was amazing. It was all torn up though. Between the constant attempts at remodeling, the fire and just its age in general, it was in need of a lot of work and completely unlivable at the time. The guide stated there were all these plans for it, but most of it never happened and it's been sold again since then. From what I've read online, the current owners have their own plans, but do not have any interest in doing tours. Only time will tell what's in store for the castle. My wife and I were camping last night in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon. We camp here often and decided to explore up FSR 520 and found a cool abandoned bridge far back in the woods over Cook Creek. The spot was beautiful and we were set up over the river on this long abandoned bridge over the creek. If you've ever been in the Oregon woods, you know that they can give off a creepy vibe and this was no exception, but it really was a dream campsite. Being 40 feet directly over a river, while on a bridge with limbs growing everywhere over, it isn't your everyday spot. I'll throw in for background that there was no one within at least three miles of us and we had to hike in a little from our car, approximately a tenth of a mile. We explored around the area for a while and didn't come across anything else in the ordinary besides a pair of shoes and a name Mona written in ash on a rock on the fire ring. While we were sitting by the fire, I noticed a very bright flash of light over the river and snapped my head up but didn't see anything. A few moments later, I was paying closer attention and watched a ball of light float. The light was very blue. My first thought was that somehow headlights had come through, but I would have heard a car and no man-made light could get to us in this isolated area. The blue light was unlike anything I had ever seen. I mentioned it to my wife, but didn't want to freak her out, so I dropped the subject soon after. Later that night in the tent, we had the mesh lining up where we could see outside. My wife gasped and watched as the same blue light floated at the end of the bridge, 30 feet away, and hovered in the air. After a good bit of time, it shot into the woods. It being late at night, we were obviously scared of someone's headlamp, but it shot away 40 times as quick as any human could go, and we saw nothing attached. Our dog left the tent and stared at that spot for the next 10 plus minutes, while also peeking down the side of the bridge very seriously. Has anyone had a similar experience on Forest Development Road 520 in Blue River Reservoir, Oregon? Or had any similar experiences in the Pacific Northwest? We have this dining set that was passed down to us when my great-grandmother passed away a little while ago. It's a really old dining set. Belongs to my great-grandfather's grandfather, so over a hundred years old. 
At the beginning, nothing really happened. There's really no activity in, well, inside my house. But then some little things started happening that would just be weird. One of the first things that happened would be my pencil case getting lost. I left it on top of the table because I'd been working there during the morning. I needed to use it that night and it wasn't there anymore. I even silently got mad at my sister because I assumed she took it. I looked in the other dining room, living room, and nothing. I just went to sleep. The next morning, I asked my mum if she took it when tidying up the stuff she had left there too, but she didn't, and it wasn't in her bedroom or desk either. I asked my sister, and she didn't take it either. Well, shit, did I lose it then? So I started looking. I looked everywhere, starting with the dining room where I'd left it first. And I mean everywhere. Under the table, under the furniture in that room, and, keep this one in mind, on every chair. Since the chairs are often covered by the tablecloth. They helped me to look for it too. Everywhere in the house. Every room, every piece of furniture and under them. Just everywhere. It didn't make sense. I left it on top of the table and I remembered this perfectly because I would always leave it on top of my two notebooks. The notebooks were there but the freaking pencil case wasn't. I kind of gave up looking for it. Although I still checked every day in the same places. Then... About two days later, we were having dinner with my family. I told them about the pencil case, and we started jokingly talking about how my great-great-great-grandfather was probably messing around with me. I had to take a chair from that dining table to get to the other room, and I was saying something along the lines of, Oh, come on, great-great-great-grandfather, just give me my pencil case back, please. As I entered the room, wouldn't you guess? The pencil case was right in front of me, on top of one of the chairs. As soon as those words came out of my mouth. Say whatever you want about ghosts, but they do have a sense of humour. This was about five years ago, when my family and I still lived in this building we had lived in for about 14 years. Let me start off by saying that this building had a lot of activity. This happened at a time when this activity had increased. I think there was a lady on some floor that my mom was sure was doing witchcraft and just bad energy work. So it's the ninth floor with apartments A, B and C. I lived in A with my mother and little sister. My brother who was already a bit older and moved to the C. I don't want to bore you with these details but they're important for the story. My dad would come in sometimes and stay in the sea when my brother wasn't there, which he wasn't that night. Also, my neighbour who lived in the bay was on vacation. This one night, I was watching some film at about 2.30, 3am. My mum always warned me not to stay up too late because, and I knew this is true, it's time for other kinds of entities to go out. I'm sitting on the couch watching a film when I hear the elevator doors open and see the lights in the hallway turn on. They have motion sensors. I can see the hallway through the hole in the doorknob and see a shadow come out of the elevator and steps. And then I heard this laugh. It wasn't my dad's laugh for sure, not my brother's either. It sounded weird, like distant, but it was right there outside my door at the same time. I figured it must have been my dad coming to sleep there and I wanted to say hi to him. I wanted to open the door but something told me not to. Something held me back. I heard it go to the sea. The keys clanking and all. Unlock the door and close it. I didn't think much of it. I went to bed right away. Next morning, I was talking to my mom and asked her if my brother had come back. She said no, he's not in the city yet. Oh, okay. Must have been dad then. So I go to the sea and check if my dad is still there. He's not, which is odd because when he comes, he usually stays for a long while. Not long after I called him to remind to pick me up that afternoon and casually asked him if he had come last night to sleep there. He sounds confused and says no. He was in the summer house with his friends until that moment. So no one had been there at all. It had been empty all weekend. Sometimes I wonder and shudder at what could have happened if I opened the door or even if I just looked through the door thingy to check if it was my dad. Something definitely stopped me from doing so. I don't know if it was an intuition or my guardian angel or whatever. I'm just glad I went to bed that night.
So back when I lived with my mom, it was a normal house. I had my own room, slept in the room closed. We had a garden that wasn't big, but it stretched out to the back pretty far. There was train tracks behind there. The end of the garden was pitch black at night. I always felt there was something there whenever I would look out my window at night. What happened was I went to sleep one night and started having a nightmare in which I wake up at night. The whole house is pitch black. I hear my mom calling me saying, come downstairs. I start walking my stairs, they were next to my door. So I walked out my door, turned, was on the stairs, got halfway down the stairs, and I hear my mom's voice from upstairs saying, that wasn't me, don't go downstairs. In the dream, I would close my eyes and hear running. We had wooden stairs. It was like when you run upstairs very quickly, type of thumping. And I was just frozen there with my eyes closed. As soon as I opened them, a witch figure, I don't know, a woman, I'd say 60 to 70, in a black dress with a deformed face like it was bumpy but thin. She'd stand there for a second or two and I'd wake up. The first time this dream happened, it was like a routine I had no control over. From that day, I started having this dream every day, basically. Whenever I got the dream, after having it the first time, I was conscious in it. I choose to go downstairs, not to go, but I would have to go through all the motions in order to wake up hearing the voice, getting halfway down the stairs, hearing a voice from upstairs, closing my eyes and the loud running noise and knowing I have to open my eyes to wake up. There were some things I tried doing to wake up without having to see her, but she would always show up. I tried keeping my eyes closed for what felt like I was in the dream, still, she was waiting for as soon as I opened them. Another time, as soon as I was in the dream, I tried running downstairs, only for her to run at me from the kitchen where also the door to the garden was. After about two years of this dream haunting me, pretty much three to five days of the week, I had three instances where I woke up after seeing her in the dream and her face had manifested in a ghost sort of manner like a see-through mist as soon as I sat up in my bed and every single time I swung my arm to give a right hook. I would punch my wall which my bed was next to. This continued up until the point where I moved out and I haven't had this dream once. It's been four or five years now since having it last time and I still think about it. Question if it was a lost spirit or what. In my house, we have a family rule not to mess with mirrors. Honestly, it's a ton of weird elaborate rules about mirrors and reflective surfaces like windows and metal etc. For example, we have a rule that mirrors can't face doors, doorways or windows. Although I seem to be the only one person still abiding by that rule. As when I started to move back, my mother moved a mirrored vanity directly parallel to a window. We also have rules about not doing mirror games. You know the kind. Bloody Mary, the tunnel game, etc. My mother was adamant that if we did, I'd be in deep trouble. This incident happened nearly 17 years ago, when I was 10. It was one of the few sleepovers I had as a kid that had more than one kid coming over. This time, it was my scouting troop, and we were doing all sorts of typical sleepover stuff. Truth or dare, never have I ever, we tried stiff as a feather. We were just having fun. It was an interesting time, and I wasn't used to this kind of stuff. But the fun was had, and as the night grew on, one of us suggested playing Bloody Mary. Now, Mama didn't raise no bitch, so when it was brought up, even though I knew the house rules, I couldn't resist looking cool. So I gave in and we decided on the whole bathroom to make our game. Our whole bathroom had a long counter mirror that stretched from one end of the counter to the next. This mirror has since been shattered by a plumber who was being a macho man. Shattered it because he couldn't wait for help. It was a pretty cool mirror and it matched the mirror at the end of the hall. So it was a bummer when it got broken. Since this incident, it was replaced by two ornate oval mirrors. These don't seem to have much in the way of activity compared to the other numerous mirrors in the house. So we eagerly gathered in the hallway. I should mention 
that my mother and grandparents had already retired to their rooms, and my mother at the time was on a sleep apnea machine, as was my grandfather. So mom and grandparents couldn't hear us. I was the first in because I was trying to keep that cool, unspookable attitude. I knew my house was haunted. I knew some really heavy shit was happening, but I couldn't help but try. So the usual happens. I go in, lock the door, turn off the lights. I say it three times. Flip on the light and look in the mirror. Nothing. Not a single thing. Honestly, I was pretty relieved. But now, I had a situation where I could mess with the others. None of them know that I didn't see anything. So why don't I just spook them? I went about the bathroom like nothing had happened, right? I go to the bathroom, chill on the toilet, and think about how cool I'm going to look, and wait until the others get nervous. A bunch of them were calling for me, worried about me. I got up and washed my hands, and after I was finished, pleased with myself, I looked in the mirror. There was something crawling out of my shower. Not ring or grudge crawling. This wasn't some spooky bitch on her hands and knees crawling out of the shower. It was something with the head and torso of a woman, attached to the body of a spider. I've had nightmares about her since. Her hair was long and black, but not stringy or wet. It was full-bodied and heavy, laying down her back and over the beginning of her spider torso. Her skin was a sickly grey-brown, and her eyes were pitch black with the yellowest sclera. Her mouth was open in a snarl, and it looked like she had rows of sharp, thin teeth. Her spider half was black, fuzzy and large, about the size of an average adult on its own, and she was crawling right towards me. I screamed, and I had the most shrill, awful scream since I was really little. A, the neighbours called my mom to make sure the family was okay, scream. Panicked, I rushed to the door, and I couldn't get it to unlock. I couldn't get the lock to move at all. I could hear it tapping towards me. It seemed to lumber with its huge frame. I kept crying and screaming, but the door wouldn't budge. Then the thing grabbed my fucking hand. I can still remember the cold, clammy feel of its hand, and the way it made my blood run ice cold. And that's when the door lock worked again. I suddenly felt a huge wave of relief, and as I swung the door open, I burst out telling the others to run. Of course, they didn't need to be convinced. Their friend was running and crying and screaming, and they were just a bunch of kids. But we didn't get far before my mother yelled and we all froze. One of the kids had stayed back to see what the fuck was going on. A more level-headed kid who thought I was bullshitting. When I blubbered out what I'd seen, I was told by my mother who investigated and the kid who had hung back that there was nothing behind me when I ran. To this day, that's still the most actively frightening situation I've been in. Two years ago, I was with my dog, taking him to go out to pee. He was being agitated and skittish, which was unlike him. He's a chow slash shepherd mix, and he's as much a protector as any other dog. So his attitude this night in particular had me on edge as well. I went to join him when I heard him growling, so I stepped out to the side of the house, hearing him absolutely lose it. For a bit of setting, there's a fence around the length of our backyard that goes about halfway up the sides of the house. The fence has a gate on either side of the house, and there are trees and overgrowth on either side of the house. Stepping out of the house, I noticed something moving in the tree line, so I quickly moved back inside. We have a baseball bat for protection, and I went to get that and came back outside. My dog was still losing it and was staring at the thing I had seen and hadn't moved. He was growling, snarling, and his ears were pinned and his tail was tucked. Something about this was really fucking him up. So I went down the side fence, letting the bat clink along the chain link making sure whoever was there knew I was armed. I'm 5'4", and look really soft and easy to take on, but I can bench 200 pounds and I'm not afraid to fuck it up. I'm also a bit of an idiot. But I'm not unused to scary things, so I was more annoyed than scared. That changed really fast though. I stood there right behind my dog and looked at this figure, which was standing dead still and hadn't moved. I considered that there was nothing there, but I couldn't know until I double-checked. I called out to the figure, 
telling the person I assumed was there that they needed to get off of private property. They were on my soon-to-be neighbour's land, and I was afraid they had been messing with the construction. Honestly, I assumed it was a teen. But then I heard an owl coo, and to be honest, we don't have many of them where I live. So I sort of feel this cold, damp dread spread across my body, and I hesitate to pull my phone out and flash the flashlight. I kind of wish I hadn't. Standing there was a figure, which was ridiculously tall, I'll say eight to ten feet, and thin and wiry. It was in all black, something like a hooded robe. It looked heavy, and it didn't hang naturally. I couldn't tell the physical size of the body of this thing because it was so heavily cloaked, but its face was the thing that really threw me for a loop. It had the face of an owl. I don't know what kind of owl, but the big black eyes, the beak, the round moon face, and it clearly had a pale tan face, and the dark brown feathers around the edges of the face. I didn't blink or move when the light hit it. I continued to stand there. I could see its chest rise and fall. My dog barked for the first time with the light on it, and then quickly I turned off the light and moved back inside. I'm a practicing witch, so after that, I quickly worked on protections for the house, my dog and me, and also cleansed because I felt electrocuted. I've seen it twice since, the first time, and my mother has seen it a few times too. She hypothesizes that it's angry about the building on the land there, and I think it's a warning. A year ago, around February, I want to say, I was chilling at home with my younger brother, who was a year younger than me. He was asleep since he spent the whole night playing GTA 5 with his friends, and it was around 1pm. And my grandmother wasn't coming home till about 5 or 6, but I was hungry. Yeah, there was food that I could cook, but I had a 20 on me, so I thought, what the hell? I'm four blocks away from Jack, so I'll just head over there. I got my shoes on and started walking since I didn't have a car. And I'm 18 at the time. Roast me if you want. Anyways, I had made it to Jack's in about 8 minutes since I was speed walking for whatever reason. I placed my order. It was a sriracha sandwich medium combo meal with a jumbo jack for my brother when he wakes up. Once my meal was done, I paid and went on my way. I shoved my change and the receipt in my pocket because I feel weird just placing it in my wallet while in a store or restaurant. Anyways, the walk was probably going to take 10 minutes to get back because I didn't want to drop anything trying to rush back to chill on YouTube and eat midway home. I noticed I felt exhausted. My arms were kind of sore and my eyes were somewhat dry. I thought it was like stupid out of shape or something, but I'm not fat or anything. So I got home and my grandmother was home already. I'd assume she just came back sooner than what she led on, but that wasn't the case. It was now 6.20pm. And I was confused as shit. I thought maybe I just overlooked the time or maybe my phone was displaying the wrong time, but that wasn't the case. My phone said 6.22 as well and the battery was lower than before. I placed my food down thinking what the hell happened? While being asked why I was gone for so long, I explained that I just went out for jacks without saying what time thinking I might get scolded. However, my food was cold as shit and my drink was flat with no ice. The receipt said 144, was when the place was ordered and paid for. Now I get it, hard to believe, but I haven't met anyone or saw online about anyone who's had that kind of experience before. And it's like wild how I lost so much time in a small trip. What's even more is that my order was wrong. I ordered curly fries and not regular. But that's my fault for being careless. If anyone knows anything that's like my case, please let me know. It wasn't scary for me. And the way I described it was kind of half-assed, given it's 3am right now. This takes place at my childhood home, which sat at the edge of the woods. To separate the woods from the yard, my dad placed a large boulder along the tree line. There's also a large mound of dirt from the foundation of the home in the woods. My youngest brother walked with a limp and was rather short and pudgy at this time. This is all slightly important. I was about 12 years old when it started. 
My two brothers, Jerry and Joe, their friend Nate and I, were playing hide and seek around the house. The entire property was fair game, woods included. My youngest brother Joe was it, and me and the two other boys hid behind the dirt mound. We waited there for 15 minutes and started getting worried because he never came looking for us. I remember volunteering to find him and I ran all around the property but never did find him. I went inside and he was playing a board game with some other friends. Okay, no big deal. I asked an adult how long he'd been inside and they said 30 minutes. I ran back outside to tell the others. When I got to the hiding spot, they were laughing. They asked how I got away from Joe. I told them that he'd been inside the entire time. They stopped laughing and looked at each other. I asked what was going on. Turns out they saw what they thought was Joe running behind me in the woods. As I reached the rocks, he just disappeared. We saw him around a lot, but kind of ignored it. Chalked it up to kids' imagination and played in the woods in groups. A few years later, we had another friend over who had never been at my house. We were all playing outside when he came into the room and asked why Joe was playing in the woods alone. We explained that Joe was at a friend's house and there was no way it was him. He insisted it was. We asked who told him about the man and he had no idea what we were talking about. Still creeps me out. My family bought a house in a small village in 2007 when I was five. I had two siblings at the time, one was seven and the other was three. A year later, another kid was born. I don't remember much from then, except I hated going into the playroom at night. We all did. Fast forward a few years, maybe four. We were having family game nights, and us kids were taking turns taking baths. When it was my turn, I was in the tub for less than five minutes. I remember seeing a woman in there with me. I washed up as quickly as possible and ran out of the bathroom. My parents told me to get back in the bath because I possibly didn't get myself clean. I completely refused and cried when they tried to push it further. I still don't feel comfortable there. My sister and I shared a room for the first six or seven years. Nothing happened in that room during that time. But for my 13th birthday, my dad remodeled it to make it bigger for me. I refused to sleep alone at night there. I would often drag my older sister to sleep with me. This was five years ago. I woke up to see a woman in a hospital gown standing in front of my closet where the remodeling was done. It wasn't sleep paralysis because I always turned over and pulled the covers over my head to go back to sleep. I was given old porcelain dolls sometime after the remodeling. This was one that I hated. She had a sister. They looked alike and had matching patterns on their dresses. The one I hated was smaller and obviously supposed to look younger. If I separated the two dolls, others near the younger one would fall off the shelf and break. My brother once thought I was awake, so he went to ask me a question. This is what he told me about what had happened, because I was actually dead asleep. He went to knock on my door, but heard voices coming from my room. Hence, why he thought I was awake. He stopped to listen and noticed there were two distinct voices. Neither were mine. I talk in my sleep, but it has to be initiated by someone first. He opened the door, but didn't want to go in, so we sent the dog in my room. The dog stopped at the door and started whining. He pushed her in. She started growling and barking. Somehow, I was still dead asleep. She crawled in bed with me and tried to wake me up, whining the entire time. I eventually woke up and ended up sleeping on the couch that night because nope to that. Same dog, same year. Remember that playroom? Yeah, this is where that comes into play. Years later, all four kids still avoid that room at night, but the kitchen is adjacent to it. So late at night, probably around 1 or 2 a.m., I went to get something to drink. The dog followed me. I was doing whatever and noticed my dog standing at the playroom door, growling. I get really creeped out and start calling her name. She ignores me. After a few minutes of that, she starts barking and going crazy. She runs around the kitchen and stops every now and then to bark into the darkness. By now, 
I'm up on the counter, crying. She stops, and I walk back to my room without taking my eyes off the playroom door. We also deal with doors opening. My crap goes missing in my room to show up in weird places later, i.e. my face masks turn up in my guitar case. Blood trips from the ceiling, but nothing is in the attic. I check for dead animals. And my faithful dog will always follow us into the playroom if we go in at night, even though she doesn't follow us around the house. So this happened a couple years back when I was in 7th grade. I was in my bedroom practicing this one song for my music class. The whole time I was practicing, the lights in my room were flickering on and off. I had even made a joke in my head about there being a ghost in my room, since ghosts and flickering lights are usually connected. I didn't give the light flickering much thought since they've been doing that for a few days now. So anyways, I was practicing the song for about 10 minutes until I was able to play each note perfectly without screwing something up. I celebrated for a second, though it had only taken a moment for me to notice that my light had stopped flickering. Like, just as I got the song right, the light had just stopped and was back to normal. At that moment I was scared shitless and just ran out of my room. I went downstairs and told my mom about what had just happened. My mom, being a superstitious woman, believed my story and said it was probably my nana, who died a few years prior to this, listening to me play. After my mom told me this, I felt really bad for just running out of the room like that. A few minutes later, I headed back to my room and upon making it there, I just said, thanks nana, and continued practicing my recorder. My lights never flickered again after that day and I ended up getting a good grade on that music assignment. So my brother was murdered 27th of November 2021. He was only 18 years old. This will be a long one, so please bear with me. He was in a relationship with a kid who we'll call Jacob that told my family he was 17. I never really liked Jacob, and I knew he had problems. My brother had found out he was 14, so he was going to break up with him. Jacob had his Facebook password when my brother was texting my sister about breaking up with him. My brother had gone and picked his boyfriend up, so they drank a shot of fireball. An argument occurred. I'm assuming from when my brother was trying to break up with him. He was stabbed in the heart at 11.47pm on the 26th of November, and was pronounced dead at 12.44am on the 27th of November. So pretty much that night of the 27th of November, I was clearly upset. I decided to take a shower. I sat in the shower, crying. I'm not super religious. I called out to my brother and told him to let me know if he's okay. I felt chills go down my back. It felt like I was getting a hug from him. The water was steaming hot. Now, call me crazy or whatever, but I know what I felt. So fast forward to about two weeks ago. I'm over at my mother's house where my brother lived before he passed. No AC was on at all. I felt a cold presence on my back again. Then, I started to feel it in one specific spot, which was on my arm. I didn't think anything of it until I told him to stop. All of a sudden, my mother and I hear running coming from the back of a trailer to where his room was, which was in front of the trailer. We were in the kitchen. We didn't see anyone this whole time. My mom starts to cry because she knew it was him. My mother has his urn in the living room. So this past week has been extremely hard for me. I've been visibly upset. I walked into my apartment and I see him clear as day. I wasn't seeing things. I have seen ghosts before and I'm sure it was him. He was happy. He didn't stay for too long. I've seen him lingering around my apartment before. I've even heard him while my daughter has been sleeping. I have his ashes around my neck. I don't want him to go. I miss him. This is the way I know he's okay. He got to hold my daughter three or four times before he was murdered. My daughter's only nine months old. I know she sees him as well. She can't tell me, but I can feel him when he's around. (laughs) 
I was living in Bournemouth, UK with my family. My parents purchased a Victorian hotel, nine guest bedrooms, and we moved into the hotel owner's accommodation. My parents had their room on the ground floor, and my brother and I had a room each in the basement. The room was a nice place. It had a happy feel to it. Except in certain areas. There was one room, number seven, on the top floor that had a strange vibe when inside it. Whilst cleaning this room, there was a closeness, as if the air around was closing in on you, and a ring in your ears that only really became apparent when you left the room itself. I always kept the door open when I had to work on this room, and was happy when I got to leave. We'll come back to this room later. Within the first few months living in the hotel, it was apparent to the whole family that things were happening that could not be explained by everyday logic. The large old doors around the hotel were heavy, and had been fitted with auto closers for fire safety reasons. This made it generally difficult to open them at times, particularly when carrying trays or hotel supplies. However, often we'd be walking through parts of the hotel and a door would swing open. We'd expect someone to walk out of the connecting room, but there'd be no one there. Another recurrence experienced by my entire family at some point or another was the feeling of being hit by a sudden gust of wind, even when in a room with all doors and windows closed. We're not just talking about a little breeze. This was like someone held a large rotary fan up to your face and put it on maximum power. Then after the wind stopped, there'd be a strong smell of a gingery aftershave. The first major incident we had involved room seven. A couple and their 10 year old daughter were staying in the room. After dinner, the parents went to the bar for some drinks, but the daughter was bored, so wanted to go and watch TV in their room. So she did. All was fine until another guest entered the bar area and asked if anyone was staying in room seven as they could hear someone screaming in that room. My parents and the girl's parents ran upstairs and went into the room and found the daughter sitting up in bed in floods of tears. When asked what was wrong, she said she'd fallen asleep and then woken up to see a man standing in the room. My parents asked what the man looked like, thinking it was one of the other guests in the hotel. But the description she gave was of a tall man wearing a top hat and that he had hair down the sides of his face, but not a beard. She effectively described a Victorian man with sideburns. Her parents asked where he went, but she didn't know. When she woke up, he told her to stay in bed and go back to sleep. This is when she said she started screaming, and when she looked back up, he was gone. They searched the hotel, but no one was found, and none of the guests came close to matching the description. They put it down to a bad dream, but my family was sure there was more to it than that. Not that we ever talked to the guests about the supernatural occurrences. We figured it would cause more issues if people actively knew. It was a few months before the next sighting. The ground floor layout of the hotel was quite basic. There was a main lobby area, and off from that there were different rooms. Lounge, dining room, kitchen, etc. The bar was part of an old extension, only accessible through the dining room. This meant that if you were sat in a certain position in the bar... You could see directly through the dining room and into the main lobby and stairs area. A guest was sitting having a drink in that exact spot. When she turned to my mum standing behind the bar and excitedly said, Oh, you have a wedding party. Mum was quite confused and asked what the guest was referring to. The guest said that a man wearing a full top hat and tails had just walked down the stairs. My mum moved around beside the bar and looked out of the window towards the entrance of the hotel. At which point the guest said, he didn't go that way, he went down to the right side of the stairs. What the guest didn't know was that the right of the stairs led to our private quarters. Mum and dad went to check but there was no one there and although there were ways out of the building, they were locked and bolted from the inside so no one could have exited through them without it showing. Another common occurrence in the hotel would be the sound of running. When on the ground floor, you'd hear running upstairs. This wasn't surprising when the hotel had guests. In an old Victorian hotel, every sound was heard and magnified. But over the Christmas break, we would shut the upper floors of the hotel and just have family time, but the running around would still continue. It was so loud at one point that we were sure someone had broken in. My brother, dad and I even went upstairs clutching kitchen knives for safety. 
but after unlocking and checking the rooms, no one was up there. A guest started staying long term at the hotel. I don't recall what his job was, but he had business some of the year in Bournemouth, and certain other days he had to travel into London. On London days, he'd need to be out of the hotel by 5am. Mum would leave him out to continental breakfast. He'd help himself to it and be gone before we woke up, returning later in the evening. One day when returning from London, he was chatting to my parents, and he said something strange had happened when he left the hotel that morning. He had come out of his room as usual, and was surprised to see a boy standing on the half landing, leading up to the top floor of the hotel. The man wasn't used to seeing someone else up at 4.30, but being polite, he said good morning to the boy. He said the boy didn't say anything. Instead, he just turned and slowly walked up to the top floor. The man thought it was strange, but carried on with his normal morning routine. My parents were puzzled by this, and asked him what the boy had looked like. He said he was around 8 or 9 years old, but could not recall what the boy was wearing. The reason my parents were confused was because at the time, we had no children staying in the hotel. Many months later, while serving breakfast, a guest came into the dining room and quite loudly asked my mum, Is this hotel haunted? All the other guests stopped eating, intrigued by the question, and even more so by what the answer would be. My mum played it cool, simply saying, why do you ask? The lady replied that she had woken up in the night and there was a boy standing in her room. She said hello to the boy and he vanished. Mum acted surprised and said it was the first time she'd heard of anything like that. Again, playing it down in front of all the listening ears. The final incident involved me. I had been saving money to buy a watch, a store watch to be precise. I had finally managed to get enough money together and had made my way to town to pick up the watch. It was my first ever expensive purchase, if I recall, around £90 at the time. When it was time to go to bed, I took the watch off and went to put it on the bedside table. However, in each room there were internal phones next to the bed. This was in case my parents needed our help or guests were checking in, so we could be called to assist. The bedside table in my room was so small, the phone took up all the space. For that reason, I decided to lay the watch over the receiver of the phone and hope no one called me in the night. My bed was one of those large metal bunk beds. It had a single bed at the top and a sofa bed below that folded out into a small double. I slept on the bottom, partly because it was a double, but realistically, because the ceiling was so low you couldn't physically sleep up top anyway. I remember being woken in the night to the loudest clanging metal sound as my whole bed shook. It felt and sounded as though someone had taken a run and jump and landed on the metal ladder of the bed. I was facing the wall at the time and remember the utter fear I felt. I would say it's the only time in my life I've been frozen in fear. No part of me would move, I just lay there, too scared to turn over and see what had caused the entire bed to shake. I'm not sure I would have been able to call for my brother, but he was away at PGL summer camp, so couldn't have helped me anyway. I lay there for hours, just staring at the wall. Finally, the light shone down the basement window and filled my room. I plucked up the courage to turn and look, and thankfully, there was nothing there. I sat up in bed, and the first thing I noticed was the watch was gone from on top of the phone. I searched around on the floor, thinking maybe it had slid off. Then I thought about the noise my bed had made, as if someone had jumped on it. Slowly peering up to the top bed, there in the middle of the mattress, was my watch. I guess the little boy wanted to play with it too. My mum went on to research the local history of the hotel. She was able to find out a doctor had lived there, when it was first built as a house. And during the time there, a young boy had died from an illness. But I can't remember the exact details of how. We owned the hotel for many years before selling it. It later was converted into flats, and I often wonder if they still have any occurrences. A little backstory on me. I wasn't a believer in the paranormal. I thought the idea was silly and in no way could believe ghosts or spirits could ever exist. 
Even with this experience, I've tried justifying this experience of what could have possibly happened, but I've never come to a conclusion. I was 13 years old at the time. A friend invited me over to his house to play the new Zelda game on the Wii. I believe it was a Skyward Sword. While playing the game, I was getting thirsty and told him I was going downstairs to get a drink of water. I left his room and noticed there was an odd shadow at the end of the hall. I could tell it was very unnatural looking. I stood there for a minute, observing the shadow. I immediately got a feeling in my stomach that something was wrong. It was a feeling of fear that I had never experienced. I eventually told myself that this was ridiculous and it's just a shadow. I took two steps forward and the shadow looked like it turned into a person. My heart was beating fast at this point. My level of fear was greatly increased. The shadow then looked like it started to walk towards me and in a blink of an eye, it vanished. I told myself, there's no way this is happening. I'm imagining things. You could only see this stuff in horror movies. I calmed myself down and got the courage to get to the stairs. You probably know where this is going at this point. I grabbed the side rail of the stairs and before I could make my first step down, it feels like a hand is touching my right shoulder. I pause myself from continuing going down the stairs. I turn around and the shadow person is now a foot away from me. I yell loud at this point. I then felt a push on my chest and crashed down the stairs. I was unconscious for five minutes. My friend, his parents and grandmother were hovering over me and making sure I was still alive. When I regained my senses, I told everyone what happened and what I saw. The grandmother starts crying and everyone's face goes white. Turns out, the grandmother has also seen the shadow person. She was afraid to live upstairs and would not go upstairs because she claimed to see the shadow person. The family told me they were considering getting the grandma checked out by a psychiatrist because no one else saw her and thought she was crazy. I never stepped foot in that house again. About a month after the incident, my friend's parents put the house up for sale. I guess they all moved out shortly after the incident. To this day, I've never had any other paranormal experiences. I kept thinking to myself, what could it have been? Was I having a medical issue at the time? I've never had any other experience since that day. The house gets put on the market every one to three years. It's been sold at least six times since I've been in that house. I can't confirm if other families have encountered what I did. All I know is that it's very odd for a house to be bought and sold that much in 14 years. I started working at a small local pizza shop in my hometown. After a few days, I became really good work friends with the early morning housekeeper for the bar next door. They actually owned the pizza shop. She was really cool and dark, very mysterious. Along with her, I made friends with some of the cooks. One cook and I started hanging out almost every weekend. Eventually, the housekeeper became comfortable with us coming over. Now, I was not expecting what I walked into. Her house was like the party store threw up Halloween and horror in our house. She had many odd collections, stones, dead flowers, herbs, and many, many books on witches and black magic. Her prized possession was a real human skull she got off a crackhead many, many years prior. Needless to say, it took some warming up to get used to her house. Though spooky, it was still very much inviting. Cut to Halloween 2020, and it's a full moon. Halloween was my friend's only holiday she ever celebrated, so we went big. By the time the cook we made friends with had become absolutely insufferable to be around. So we hatched an idea to scare the absolute piss out of him. The plan? My friend and her daughter and I sat down to talk about what we wanted to do. I mentioned how it was a full moon, so how about we go to the oldest cemetery near us at midnight and do some EVPs and stuff? They said absolutely. Now, I'll just name my lady friend T. T was very into black magic. She wanted to take her witch's bell and open a portal. I didn't really believe her, but went with it. Her daughter chimed in with the brilliant idea to construct a mock debug box. 
And when we got there, she would smash it on the ground and start acting up to scare the cook off. We should have known better. Well, I should have. Halloween night. We were a bit late getting out the door, but at about 11.30 that night, we left T's place. The cook drove and I sat shotgun. T and her daughter were in the back, her daughter with the dibbuk box in hand. We had told him she ordered it offline. T did an amazing job making it look absolutely authentic. So as we drove, we didn't think much about the box. I had brought my EVP recorder and EMF detector with us. I set the EMF detector in the door as we drove and had it off. All of a sudden, T's daughter giggled and shook the mock Dybbuk box. And out of nowhere, my EMF meter started to sound off and beep. It wasn't on. We all went silent and the whole mood shifted. We got to the cemetery and all kind of nervously got out of the car. The whole area was glowing. The leaves glistened in the moonlight and the tombstones were almost ethereal with the glow from the granite reflecting the moon. Clear skies and all alone, we slowly made our way to the back part of the cemetery. It was so beyond silent out there. We find a good spot and T says, okay, everyone sits in a circle. She then opens a container and pours her sacred salt mix around us and warns us not to leave for any reason until we're done. At this point, I'm ready to go home. The cook looks terrified. I'm absolutely dreading the feelings in the air. So we all sit. T puts the box in the middle of us and puts both the EMF and EVP recorder next to it. Her daughter started playing a spirit box app and the sounds that came out of it silenced us. Let. Me. Out. It said. Then the EMF went nuts. Suddenly, I got that gut sinking feeling I wasn't alone with them anymore and we were in serious trouble. Silence falls over us and we all kind of stare at each other. Now me, T and her daughter had not at all planned on this box actually being real. But somehow, she managed to catch some entity inside. Then, like we were snapped from a trance, we realised there was walking coming from woods inches from us. We can clearly see no one is there. I closed my eyes and grabbed T's hand and said, Okay, I'm officially scared. What do we do? She said, It's fine. Ghosts aren't real. I said, Bitch, you and I both know that's a lie. As I said that, the cook stands up and says, Yo, guys, I think we really need to get the heck out of here. I can hear people all around us. At this point, he kicks the salt circle open and starts walking to the car. T's daughter smashes the box and says, Screw it, let's go. So we all frantically follow. When us girls got home, we knew we messed up. We didn't close the door, we opened. We actually caught something in the box. We might have let it out there by accident. All I know is since then, none of us four have been right. I never feel like I'm alone. And if I'm working alone, I always have to double check I'm really alone. I've always believed in the paranormal, but now I'm a firm believer in black magic and witchcraft. Thoughts, opinion, advice. Shortly after this, we all had a falling out and no longer speak to each other.